Wood's latest attempt to bringing diversity to the big screen. Crazy Rich Asians? Well, today, Lisa will share about her own real-life romantic comedy drama. Crazy Rich Melvins. <laughs> P.S. Not in the rich and famous sense. Does anyway, Lisa will be doing her icebreaker speech from the level one innovation pathway. Lisa Melvin. Many times I have been asked how I ended up in Wenatchee. And the short answer is, I married a Wenatchee boy. And the long answer is, I married a Wenatchee boy. <laughs> On the 14th of August, this month, we will be celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary. <laughs> how I met my husband is rather unromantic and a little strange. But I did realize at the time, I did not hyperventilate, but I did realize at the time that he was my soulmate. And actually, he had to sell his prized Cannondale mountain bike in order to come to Australia. I was the one with the most money, not him. And in order to come to Australia, we told the, the government officials that he was coming, we were getting married. And so, of course, that set off a whole long process, and he had to come on a fiancé's visa. And then they wanted a sponsor, so my dad, who had never met my future husband, needed to sponsor him because he had to guarantee that if this man ever decided to become dependent on the state for so many years that he would cover that cost. So it was a big step for my dad, who never met this man, but he trusted my judgment. Well, my husband eventually did arrive in Australia a little late. We had to cancel the wedding one time. And we got married, of course, 14th of August, 1993. It was a very simple church wedding, and in, we had an afternoon tea and, of course, the traditional fruitcake. And for those of you who have recently been in the news and Prince Harry and, and Duchess Meghan, they did away with traditional fruit, fruit cake. But for Australian weddings, we traditionally have this very heavy fruit cake covered with very thick icing and it can actually last more than a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, after a few months as newlyweds, we flew to Spain on a one-way ticket. It was December 25th, 1993. And our goal was actually to move into the country of Morocco. And we did eventually do that in April of 1994. When we got there, we were learning language and culture. And my husband was actually working in ecotourism, which was really just a front because we were actually missionaries and we were with Youth with a Mission. Youth with a Mission is, a, is, is an evangelical interdenominational Christian organization. And that was why we were there. After some more months went by, I became pregnant and our son was born. Actually, we decided to stay in the country, which was very unusual for a lot of uh, missionaries. Traditionally, they would go back home, but home was just too far away. So we decided to stay. And my son, my firstborn, who was a boy, was born in the hospital in Rabat, which was the capital there. We had a great doctor and it was a private hospital and for a cesarean section only cost us $1,000. Of course, going, you know, re uh, fast forwarding another couple of years, my daughter was born and she was born in the same hospital. And interestingly enough, when, when I first went in with my son, my language wasn't that great because obviously they're speaking a different language than English, they spoke Arabic and French. And when you learn language, they traditionally don't teach you some of those verbs about bodily functions. Uh -oh. <laughs> and they kept on asking me the same question over and over again. And of course it was, have you passed gas? I did not know that verb, but of course that was when I learnt and everybody else would be giggling under their breath. Uh, but it was one of those very odd language and cultural moments that I can recall. And of course, we were in the same hospital and everybody's asking, do you remember me? Yes, I remember you. And they were all very happy that I was there with my second child. And it was, it was a very memorable experience. Well, coming back 
we we moved we moved around a lot in in Morocco, and actually with our wedding funds, because people couldn't na actually buy us gifts because we were tr going to travel. They gave us some, um, some money to buy furniture. And of course, we actually didn't get to move into a house and buy furniture until several years later because we were kind of moving around. And that, and that meant we started our home. And our first home was rather unusual in the traditional sense. We had a little <coughs> adobe kind of uh, apartment building. We were on the bottom floor. The family who owned that building were on the top floor. And we had a very traditional looking home in the Moroccan sense. It was very cozy. No hot running water, but we did have running water. And then of course, as time goes on, and we had we had a, I have a plethora of Land Rover stories, because Land Rovers, if you know about Land Rovers, their old Land Rovers can break down and they frequently did. And we have many interesting stories about that. And my favorite memory really from the country of Morocco is the fantastic hospitality that we experienced over the years. They have incredible food, which you now see a lot on these Food Channel shows. Mm. But back then, it was very, it wasn't very well known how good the food was there. But the hospitality was amazing, and it taught me a lot about hospitality in general. Well, over the years, we decided to come back to the U.S., which meant I needed to become an immigrant and I had to front up to the embassy in Casablanca. William, I remember his name, was standing at the window and actually quite relieved to see us because for him, we were a, a very easy case. We were, had been married for a number of years, we had kids. And yet he was used to, and I don't really like to stereotype, but he was used to an older American woman suddenly marrying a Moroccan man who was maybe 20, 30 years her junior, and they wanted to go to America. So that's kind of what William was used to dealing with. So we were an easy case. But anyway, that, that was my journey as an immigrant and coming into the country, of which I ended up coming very late at night with my paperwork and thinking, oh my goodness, this man is going to absolutely you know, hate me because there I am at midnight with my packet, which was very extensive and a lot of rubber stamping and that kind of thing. Of course, time went on and, as you know, 9-11 affected all of us and it was very tragic. Of course, for us who were overseas, uh, we got tired of talking about American foreign policy and also we didn't really know where we stood in terms of the Patriot Act and the formation of Homeland Security because we were a dual nationality family and there's no guarantee just because you're married to, to a citizen means that you get automatically, you know, automatic entry. So we made that transition in 2003, and it was probably three three of the hardest years of my life making that transition as a family, because we lived next to the Steppers for a year during that transition. It wasn't, they weren't the hard part. <laughs> <laughs> but it was really difficult just to kind of get in culture, and for my husband obviously re-entering into his own culture, and for me, entering into a completely different culture after having that experience for so many years. And of course he was working on his education and, and we were obviously very low income for a very long time. In the last couple of years, uh, we've had a lot of family members come to visit, which has been a lot of fun. And he, um, of course, last year was, a, uh, after about 15 years in Wenatchee, was a very tough year for the both of us because we actually spent our 24th wedding anniversary while I, I was in surgery and my husband was in the waiting room and we knew the outcome was probably not going to be good. And it wasn't. So that was a tough one. But here we are almost a year later and I think for our married life, the, you hear this buzzword around the place these days, secret source. I'd say the secret source to our union is really faithfulness. And Faithfulness really implies a steadfast adherence to a person to which one is bound by an oath or an obligation, and also loyalty, because that implies an undeviating allegiance to a person which one also feels morally bound to support or defend, and a constancy that suggests there's freedom for fickleness or uh, of affections or loyalties. So I say that's our secret source to our 25 years.
please take a moment and write your comments.